Oh, <laughs> hi everyone. <laughs> this is Shannon O'Loughlin, citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, coming to you live this Friday evening for another episode, the 60th freaking episode of Red Hoop Talk. I am coming to you from the beautiful homelands of the Piscataway peoples. And I hope that you know already that our guest tonight is uh, from the Piscataway Indian Nation. So we'll be welcoming her shortly. I'm very excited about having her and having, having a neighbor uh, to interview tonight. So uh, let's see, what have we got going on here that I've got to share with you guys? Um, this is brought to you by the Association on American Indian Affairs, the oldest nonprofit serving Indian country. It's been around since 1922. Check them out. Check us out on the website, uh, www.indian-affairs.org. So how's everyone doing tonight? Let's let's look at the chat here, you guys uh, and, and gals and theys and thems and um, uh, two-leggeds, four-leggeds, whoever can talk, um, say hi, let us know where you're coming from. And if you are tribally affiliated, let us know who you are. Uh, let's see what's going on this week. Uh, cicadas are killing me. The cicadas are killing me. So we're here in uh, the Piscataway homelands, which is now known as Maryland, and the uh, going out for walks, and they just land on you. And of, of course, it's always a surprise. And so you go to swat them away, and you're swatting away this big chunk of, of bug meat. It's, it's, it's pretty disgusting. But I hear, uh, check this out, I'm going to share it on, you know how slow I am with the sharing business here. Um, on Monday, I hope you all are, are friends of Native American Calling. Um, it's a live radio show uh, Monday through Friday. On Monday, they're gonna be talking about the cicada invasion and how it is a traditional indigenous food bounty. And, you know, I did some searching about cicadas to see what they might taste like. And so it seems to be a mixture of like nutty or asparagus taste and that they're best air fried. I don't know where you get a indigenous air fryer, but, but they're best air fried because if you bite down on them, <laughs> I guess they're kind of a, bursty, squishy in there. So um, yeah, I would imagine that, that cooking them would be helpful, make them all nice and crunchy, but their protein content is similar to like crickets and cricket protein. So um, good stuff. You get hungry, head outside, get you a cicada. Uh, another wonderful thing that has happened this week, if you did not know, um, is that the Keystone XL pipeline is dead. It has been canceled. Here, I was going to bring up a quick article from our friends at Native News Online. Whoops. There, where is it? There it is. Uh, Trans Canada Energy um, has canceled, has killed it, and they say they're going to work with um, Canada and indigenous nations in Canada to um, close everything out uh, and and be done with it. Uh, tribes and everyone is ecstatic. And if 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 you if you don't recall, um, the pipeline was bringing uh, the tar sands in Canada into the United States, and many tribes opposed this. And the Biden administration recently overturned. Um, the permit given uh, to the to the pipeline to um, uh, work in the U.S. and um, looks like that was enough for them. So um, that is done. Would love to hear what you're thinking about what that means for us and the climate change policy of the Biden administration, as well as uh, hey, Dapple. Um, is that going to hopefully kill Dapple? Uh, but I, I read a little bit and I heard even other kind of oil lobbying groups and organizations talking about, well, I guess 
that tar sands project really must have not been that important if it was that easy for them to cancel uh, the project. Um, but let me remind you, it, it's taken 10 years. I think they know that the time and the world is changing. Um, so sorry, I had to adjust my shirt. I was seeing my bra there. Did you see that? <laughs> Always something new and fun happening here on Red Hoop Talk. I see Sarah there in the chat room. Welcome, uh, Heli Toe. Uh, glad you're here with us, Sarah. Um, please feel free to, to chat, ask questions of our guest, which I'm sure you're tired of me talking by now, uh, which is coming up next. Um, I want to interest, interest, in. <laughs> to introduce you all to um, Gabrielle Tayak. She's a member of the Piscataway Indian Nation. Hello, Gabby. And uh, we should call her Dr. Gabby. And she has got, for such a, a young woman, uh, you have got uh, the brilliance of Einstein in a grassroots activist, you know, energized body. I'm so grateful to have you. And I'm so glad to have a, a citizen from the Piscataway peoples, from the place where I'm uh, residing now uh, with us today to, to, to talk. And, and so let's start there. Um, Gabby, is there any way that you want to introduce yourself just to share a little more information about who you are with, with folks out there? Oh, well, first, it's just so nice to um, be with you. And thank you for setting always um, such a, a, a warm and committed kind of feeling, Shannon. So to have the chance to hang out with you and, and people who drop in um, for the evening, I'm, I'm just um, grateful to be in this um, space that, that you've opened and, and also to um, always uh, yeah, be mindful that, you know, there's so many reasons that people come to Washington, D.C., especially from Indian country, and then to resituate it um, in the mind that there's people who, you know, live here and have lived here for a long time or intergenerationally. Um, for Piscataway, our our area co goes from really like from uh, what they call Point of Rocks, which is above Great Falls, all the way down to where the Potomac meets the Chesapeake Bay. So that whole, you know, that whole sweep. Um, so just to just to be uh, grounded here. So I'm I'm actually, you know, I'm I'm here. In in, in DC for um, for reasons that are that are sometimes different than um, other people who are really active and, and engaged in working on policy, but it overlaps. But that's because this is this is really homeland um, for me and the family, and and for me to be here and to come back here because I grew up in New York, um, but I've been back here full time for oh, about twenty eight years. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's it's been a long row, and maybe for those of you know people who are are also natives from um, you know urban or like closer to urban areas like Wampanoag or or folks like Sh you know Shinnecock or um, other people that are are closer into um, urban areas. You know, I think sometimes we just you know you see all these built spaces, but you see something different. Um, almost yeah. like the time slips to it. So, yeah, so just really, really good to be able to talk with you. Thank and you. Thank you. This uh, KXL um, decision. Yeah. Hard run. Yeah. Thank goodness. It's about time. It's about time. But let's let's leave them alone. We're going to we're mm -hmm. going to get into some of this activism that you've helped uh, to generate, um, Gabby. But I, I want to learn more about uh, Piscataway peoples and this land and place. And I know that the, the Piscataway Indian Nation is state recognized um, back in 2012, I think, uh, by the state. Uh, and people always ask, isn't the first question that people always ask, well, are you all trying to get federal recognition? Um, uh, why aren't you federally recognized? Those kind of questions um, 
do you all have any like positions or stance or why or wherefore about any of that? Are you involved in, in any of that? Yeah. So um, thanks for going right straight to that, to that point, because um, sometimes when people hear about state recognized, um, some sometimes the assumption is is that this is a you know new group that's just come together that you know is trying to find themselves or what's what's their story really or how how attached are they right? Um, just to just to really uh, bring it into focus, um, Piscataway, um, we're a people that uh, you know. Uh, we're, well, we're for, you know, this is a very, you know, very early contact people, right? Like, so mm -hmm. the waves of everything that's, that's happened um, here on the Atlantic seaboard uh, happened very early. So, you know, earliest contacts, even being as we think as early as 1565, 1585. Um, and so by the time even, you know, Plymouth happened, we'd already been in contact for quite some time. <laughs> and so you have all of the issues of of um, missionization and reservations and removals and mass death and militarization um, that's kind of locked all into place by the seventeen uh, by about seventeen twenty. Um, most of our people did end up migrating north and uh, became part of primarily part of the uh, Haudenosaunee, but coming right. through the Cayuga Wolf Clan. But there is a group of us, um, we were converted to Catholicism, um, at least nominally, um, in 1640. And our, the community that still is together today um, still um, has family members, including my uncle, um, who attend the same Catholic church where that conversion took place. It's um, actually the oldest Catholic um, continuous congregation in what became the United States. So our people um, have been there. Um, there's like seven surnames, all like intermarried over time. Um, we were always identified as Indians uh, within the Catholic church records. Um, so that's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a really tight community. Mm -hmm. Um, we understood that we thought that we had, um, state recognition to be quite honest or colonial recognition. Um, some people know, or, you know, we're, we can think back long enough my, my grandfather, um, who went by the name Turkey Tayak, um, he was a, an activist uh, organizing East Coast people from the 1920s um, onward and uh, traveled up all and down the East Coast um, with Lumbee, Powhatan, Nanakoke, um, the societies in New York City. And um, he, we ended up having him buried by an act of Congress um, as in, in his title in our ancestral burial ground, which is now in a national park. And so we were very close to federal recognition and then they took out the tribal designation. That was 1978. Um, we did, a, we have applied our petition for um, federal has been in process since 1978. We applied right away. Wow. Um, and has gone through, I think the last like tech, you know, what they call like the technical assistance review was I think 19, the mid 1990s. Um, we were told in 1993 that there was like a new process that we all had to go through and recertify state. And so it took another 18 years for us to, because we we're like, what are you talking about? Like there's all kinds of, you know, we had state legislative le resolutions about us from the seventies and, um, interaction so why do we have to go through this process so we had to go through that process again which mirrors the federal um it, it the maryland uh regulations for state recognition mm -hmm. um go they they mirror the guidelines for federal so we had to put in i mean you know like other federal petitions thousands of pages and i think the um you know to show all the interaction and the endogamy in, in marriage whatever you know the whole thing and then it, it, we finally got it restored in 2012 we were found to meet all the criteria in the late 90s but um what we found was that there was an accusation that you know 
um, the idea that there's this confounding of of uh, federal rec you know state recognition would lead for us to do gaming. Yeah, there was a talk from uh, Governor Glenn Denning um, saying that that we met all the, you know even though we met all the criteria, he wasn't going to sign it. So that sat on ice for another like 15 years. So here's the interesting thing, and I'm just going to be real because I like to you know real talk, okay? Um, by um, in in uh, in I think it was it was in 2011, uh, the state of Maryland signed the gaming compact with MGM, um, and within three months we got our our state recognition. So the state we, gaming came first, right? And then they'll recognize the tribe. So I was like, how oh, is there a correlation? <laughs> Which is so ridiculous because we all know that state recognition has nothing to do, like you don't get anything. <laughs> like, right. So people are like, okay, so you did all this work because I worked on um, our petition. I submitted it when I was nine months pregnant with my oldest son in 1994. Um, it wasn't until he graduated from high school um, that in 2012 that it passed. It was his entire life. Um, and going to meetings and meetings and meetings and lobbying and whatever and we finally got it and then you know i had some we had some family members and other tribal members called they're like so like what do we get i'm like nothing <laughs> like you don't get any benefits for state nothing it gives us a little bit of a possibility to um you know, I mean, of course, like it means like okay, Indian Arts and Crafts Act, and quite honestly, a lot of it has to do with, you know, we know that there's always questions about um, legitimacy. We know that there's a lot of very valid um, concerns about abuse of identity fraud. We're seeing that a lot today. We've had issues with that. We know that that's absolutely a factor. Um, what we felt was that at least state recognition could give us some um, restoration of of some possibility. Our treaties are all with um, with uh, the Maryland colony, um, and interestingly, DC just um, recognized um, we we get we get free fishing licenses in Washington DC because of the treaty of 1666. So we saved ten dollars. Mm. No, I'm being like superstitious, but I'm just saying that you know a lot of it had to do with. Um, our folks uh, feeling, you know, very strongly, right? Like yeah. that that this was something we have this we have this, um, you know, this extremely tight um, history. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that we really have to contend with um, here on the Atlantic Seaboard is that you know, we're the testing ground, you know, we were the, the first um, hits for all of the things that were unleashed upon you um, to the West, even when we talk about the West, I mean, Appalachian Mountains, just slightly inland, um, on and on and on and on, you know, with an incredible virulence and viciousness, like, I mean, you know, look at just what, you know, it's been found at Kamloops, you know, the like horror yeah. um, of that. And um, what we also contend with, which is very specific and distinctive and unique that I've been working on, and a lot of this has been like soul searching, but also researching, um, has been, uh, we, we have also been subject to race law um, on the Atlantic seaboard. Um, so we do have something that is um, distinctive in, in the sense that it's, um, you know, uh, very early Indian policies and, and um, experiences, distinctive um, categorizations in the church. We sat, uh, we had to sit in the back uh, pews like of the church um, until 1964. And um, in the Catholic church. In the Catholic church. In the Catholic church. In the Catholic church. So white sat in the front. Um, Indians sat in the back and black people had to sit up um, in the galley. Uh, horrible. Uh, until 1964, like until 1964. So that's like three years before I was born, right? Um, so so there's um, there's that kind of, of issue that um, we really have to work with. So yeah, so in terms of federal, um, those so that went get, how long? Is there the, any? The petitions are active, yeah. um, but they've been, you know, 
in reality, you know, federal petitions take a very, very, very long time. Um, I've put, I put about 20 years of my life into it. I'll be real, like, I kind of feel like sometimes you have to um, make some decisions. So this was a personal decision for me was to say, I could either continue um, to, you know, continue with this, like bang your head against the wall, or what can, what can we sit back and grow and create as um, living, breathing um, people who are deserving of, of joy. Wow. And so, you know, and, and growth and transformation, like those are all things, but, you know, we still have folks like working very, you know, that are still working on the petition and yeah, my, all my research and whatever, and I help out, and, you know, who knows I might get dragged back in, but it's, it's a hard row. I think a lot of people don't realize um, how um, long of a road it is. And also the idea that, um, you know, when you're when you're talking about records like uh, for like communities like ours, mm -hmm. there is a lot of um, tough stuff there. That's you know where you get identified as as mulatto free people of color on the census, and then as Indian um, in the church records. And how do you reconcile? Like how do you how do you deal with that when you don't fit the category, right? So, so those are all pieces that that I think people need to keep in mind, and um, we're working on it. But it's also, um, and then you know, there's a, it was so so interesting. My dad always said to me um, when I when he was some of our older people were like, "What do you mean, right? What do you mean recognize? <laughs> like, what are you talking about?" And my dad was like, "Well, the nuns sure recognized me when they beat the hell out of me. Oh. They they recognized me." You know, when the when the when when the when the priest tortured me and called me a savage, they recognized me. I remember him saying that. I was like, wow, wow, because he was he didn't like to talk about that. And I remember he said that to me one day when I was like, Oh, I don't know about the recognition. She was like, Well, I'll tell you who recognized me. And um I think about that. And um that's not just like a, a flippant story, that's you know it a lot of people were, 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 you know, they were brutalized intergenerationally. And um, so a lot of our older people who had to live through that, um, and these are day schools, they weren't boarding schools, um, but day schools. Um, Wasn't the first boarding school in Maryland in the 1600s? I didn't know that it was Catholic. I thought it was Protestant. Well, there was William and Mary. Um, which is Virginia. Virginia. But no, yeah. there's one in Maryland in the 1600s. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look it up real quick while we're talking. Yeah. But anyway, I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, and I, um, and I mm -hmm. go ahead. No, I'm just going to say like that that's something that um, in, in order, you know, that's, those are like the full grasps of, of history as, as people actually live them and so you know for a lot of our older people like even the notion that you had to be recognized like they were like what <laughs> and so i mean seriously they were they were they were like shocked uh, they were shocked like that that they had to even deal with this so you know those are who are younger and I'm like i'm not that way young anymore i'm 53 now but it's like youngish youngish sort of like elder um but you know having to having to go through this and then saying like okay so who's gonna you know some of us you know like you i know um and and those who are engaged in this conversation are and are active sometimes you know we're we're people who we decide that we're going to take um you know, we'll take the hits for our people sometimes. Yeah. So, so, so growing up, so, so one thing, and then I'm going to ask you a question. So it's called the society of Jesus. So they hmm. weren't Catholic, but the society of Jesus, 1634, Andrew White of the society of Jesus established a mission in what's now the state of Maryland. And the purpose of the mission was to extend civilization and instruction to the ignorant native Americans and show them the way to heaven. And then in 1677, the Society of Jesus opens a school for humanities to bring Native students to a higher state of virtue and civilization. And in, and uh, and then, of course, you know, um, Pratt and Carlisle and, 
you know, are later in time, but that's, that's Maryland. That's you all. I'm assuming. Yeah, well, yeah, that is. And Society of Jesus is a Jesuit. And those Jesuits, are, that's right. So that's Catholic. That's yes. Father and right is the one who did it. So, right. So in terms of, right, yes. The, um, you know, the, you know, boarding, the residential, the Catholic conversions, the mission, you know, the missions. Um, when you look at the structure, there's like a structure down at uh, St. Mary's that has been reconstructed to look like what the original Jesuit mission looks like. It actually looks like, you know, those old Spanish, you know, missions that you see in, you know, Southern California. Yeah. Um, it's that same style, that Jesuit style, um, which you don't necessarily think about when you think about the East Coast, but that's what it looked like. And yeah, that's what happened. I mean, it was really, so, you know, uh, like when I'm talking about, like with the missionization and the, and just all the, the takeovers, like that was from, well, for here, 1634, um, Andrew White's church, that's the one that I'm talking about, that, oh. you know, the brick, the bricks are still from um, the the mid-1600s, like, in that building, and my great-grandmother's buried there. Damn. So, like, yeah, I know. So, so um, you know, it's going through all those, uh, going through that whole process, like, when you talk about almost, like, 100 years, like, our first 100 years, is um done by you know yeah 1620 <laughs> like, like that's already a hundred years in and at that point a lot of our people did go up north but we do know part of what i i've been working on too is this this case was a court case of um of a Indian woman chief who was still down here um, into the early 1700s. And we know there were also lawsuits. Some of our, our um, Piscataway people sued to get their land back around the 1720s, 1730s. There's a case of a man named John Pye who sued the province um, to, to, to have his land returned, to, to be able to live on his land again. Wow. So like, that's all Piscataway and, and it's all, you know, so, and in the meantime, you know, we also are an early blended group of people uh, marrying uh, people who were mixed, um, you know, the children of indentured white women and enslaved African men also married into our people. And that's where a lot of our original surnames come from. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from the 1680s, so Proctor, Butler, Thompson, all of those names, Swan, like that comes from those early, early, early mixes down in the Catholic missions. Like that's that. So that's really like, that's who we are. That's who we are. And um, it's a, it's a really interesting um, history. It's a real Atlantic history. Yeah. Been so, looking so, for like for years, <laughs> figuring it out. Well, yeah. And, and in case you all didn't know, um, Oh, uh, Gabi is a historian and, and she's a fabulous historian, not just about um, what some uh, uh, historians think about as far as uh, the Americas, uh, but we're talking the ancestors to um, uh, today. So um, Gabi's a, a, a fascinating historian and I've gotten the opportunity to listen to her on numerous occasions. So check her out on, on YouTube. I think you can find her in uh, various places. So let's talk about you um, and what it was like growing up in that environment and what made you take this, this academic, but it wasn't just academic. It was like you went to Cornell and you were at Amnesty International causing all sorts of, of goodness to happen. And uh, then you went to Harvard to get your doctorate. I mean, what the hell was that about? But, but how, so what, what put you on that path uh, of this academic and activist career? Hmm. That's a great question, right? Right, and like Harvard, don't hold it against me, please. Yeah. <laughs> no, I won't, maybe <laughs> no, I, no, I know it's right, there's always this, you know, balance and, and no, I appreciate that. I mean, I think it really comes uh, first from, from uh, you know, it's always like right blends of circumstances, family, personality, things like that. Um, I think um, for me, um, yeah, I, I, so I grew up in New York. I was born and raised in New York. My father left um, this 
area because it was it was it was so racist like people don't think about you know if you're from another place sometimes and you come here you don't really realize like how incredibly racist um the situation you're was. in maryland or up in new york in maryland in maryland so he left and um you know he left and went out into the wider world and um ended up he was a ship's navigator uh, and quite a number of, of our, our folks are, um, you know, we're water people. And so he, he ended up as a sailor um, and settled into New York City eventually. Met my mom, who was a, a Jewish beatnik girl, like uh, about 11 years younger uh, than him. Really? And the two, yeah. Oh, so your dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you <laughs> know, the two of them, they met, they just... Um, found each other and I think, um, you know, came from from really interesting histories and everybody thought they would last for, you know, together for like two weeks and they were married till he died for like 46 years. And um, so it, it's really a combination of of this interest of, of following um, the root of, of the mind, right? Like the, even uh, this idea about um, no, nobody can take your nobody nobody can take your intellect from you they can take everything else from you um and this also love of um of learning of questioning um of trying to get to the root of of things and then i think both of the both sets of my grandparents uh were both very activist um so both from my mother's side and my father's side very activist in human rights social rights um my granddad and uh his family you know my dad's side were um act you know indian rights activists from the 1920s onward and so i think kind of growing up with that with that um blend um i'm also like super nerdy <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, not athletic, not talented, nothing. <laughs> you know, just like reading a lot and um, being kind of, um, you know, sometimes you're just like good at something, right? Like, and so I was like, okay, so yeah. what can I do? Um, like, what's what's what what can be my contribution? Like, also finding the truth. You know, and and being able to you know, to understand, like you need to question. You know, why are things um, the way they are? Why are the stories that that we're being told? I mean, certainly um, in school, uh, you know what it. You know, so many of us, right? We go through this um, situation where you know we know what we are being taught at home or what we read on our own. Um, and then you go into school um, and they tell you that, you know, it's, it's about native people, like everything they say to you is act, actually wrong. Yeah. And this is where I, I want to make, a, I, I want to want to give a very, very big thank you to the association because when I was in high school, um, I got into a, like a knockdown drag out with my, with a social studies teacher. Um, who uh, was insisting that all Native Americans pretty much had disappeared, that they were um, so, you know, deficient in the face of the larger civilization. And I was like, you are so wrong. And we got into a huge fight and I said, I'm going to prove it to you. And I called the associate, I called you guys. Yes. <laughs> and this was in New York. I, and I hope we we said the right things. You right. didn't just say the right things. I'm trying to remember who, came to my school. Really? Yeah. Awesome. I think it yes. was your director or your attorney at the time. Was it Jack Trope? Yes. Oh. I believe that's who it was. And he came to my school in wow. the morning. Wow. My school and talked to my teacher and then talked to an assembly. And I think to feel, um, you know, because so many of us, right, who grew up in cities, sometimes we're only we're the only Native person right. at our school. Yeah, and so that I think that was like the first time, like somebody, you know, they came, somebody came, and um, and and told the truth with with a you know like an authority and a, and a degree and and um, pretty fearless, and it really. Mr. First shut his mouth. 
<laughs> so, so I just have to say that, um, yeah, so it, it, it really, it was really also about always wanting to know like, well, what, what happened to us? Like, what's the undercover story here? Like what's underneath all these buildings? Where, where, what happened to all our, our people here? You know, like, where did everybody go? And then yeah. um, knowing that the way that that's written and the way that that's told is, is just wrong and um, wanting to be able to use this um, opportunity, you know, the opportunity, honestly, and the support that I was given. I always feel like it's a blend of of accident for like where where you're born and to whom you're born to, um, you know, it's accident, opportunity, and merit. Mm. Um, and then I had, the, you know, this opportunity um, and then just worked at it and felt, I also always felt like, I was one of the ones who who made it alive and how right like yeah. you're you know you're the one who made it alive who has who can um speak um there's so many who didn't make it yeah. um or were silenced or so um traumatized um that they can barely you know and so it was it was sort of this this convergence of of that to say well and and also to know um that sometimes i, I think especially being piscataway because we really you know we did come down to like four identified families we came down to really like my grandfather being like the main like really the main kind of outside spokesperson and also understanding that how fragile that is and so you know it could end with you like that that's i think you know i know it's like a lot but i always think about that like you know how many how many how many communities like where it comes down to it's like oh if it wasn't for that one person or that those few ladies that stayed there like it you know, we know about that story at Pequot, you know, it's like those ladies that stayed. Um, so. And kept fighting and kept saying, this is who we are. This is who we are. Um, and it and it didn't matter um, who said what about it. They just kept saying, this is who we are. And that's what you all have been doing. And, and, um, and I would imagine you had to do some of that along your, your academic path as well because you don't you don't get a freaking doctorate gobby um uh, very easily if you're an indigenous person because it's it can be quite hard um uh unless you just westernize your approach and do everything they tell you to do and to me you don't seem like the kind of person that did that i think you fought for um uh that doctorate yeah um I appreciate the perception on that because I did, you know, it, it took me, it took me nine years. It took me six, six iterations um, because so, and, and the reason I went for the, the reason I went for the doctorate, um, it wasn't like I wanted to do the doctorate and then, oh, what am I going to study? I had a very clear idea what I wanted to do. And it had to do with telling, um, the story, um, you know, really getting to the history of um, Piscataway people, but also uh, getting to the sense of understanding what, you know, how, what does it take? Like, what does it mean? Like, how, how did we actually um, make it? What about all those, you know, early movement? You know, we think about, you know, th there's the American Indian movement, right? And these other um, indigenous rights movements that we see emerging from the 60s, 70s, we know that we see them in the plains, but as you know, um, you know, from Choctaw, like, it's real, you know, you have very early on people um, who are taking, you know, either one route or the other. Um, early right. on, like really early on and, and, and getting a sense of, of, you know, well, what does it take? Like, what does it actually take um, to make those movements and to make that happen? And also like, what's the story from the inside? Not just like, oh, what's all done to you, but like, what's going on um, within the, within the people, you know, what do they create? Like their activity, their voice. And so, 
I that's why I decided I wanted to understand like the bigger structure of like how what 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 happened <laughs> and like what was happening. Um, I initially thought I was going to be like a therapist, um, which yeah, was you weren't into well. social work, right? Yeah, like I wanted to do, maybe do like. Um, you know, work and native community, which is actually really important. I'm kind of like coming back around to that now in my older phase, but, you know, but it went um, from looking as, as being trained as a social worker. And also I do want to say like, thank goodness. Um, I, I chose to go to Cornell as an undergrad because they had a very strong American Indian program and what their, their philosophy and their implementation was, was this idea of full circle. So like you could go um, there and, you know, go through the whole educational process and their ethic was to get you back either, you know, into your home community, working with native people and that you could do that with, uh, you know, with a university degree. And that's why I decided to go there and they recruited me to go there um, with that in mind. And so I think, you know, it was it was people like Ron LaFrance um, up at Aquasasne, um, Jose Barrero, um, people that were, you know, uh, Rick Hill, yep. um, another one, Pete Jemison, John Mohawk, like we're all like engaged in that level and they really influenced me a great deal um where you know john mohawk said um the in the indian tradition is a thinking tradition and so so to understand all of those things so yeah with the doctorate it was um to get into being able to say that you know our elders our knowledge keepers um their expertise their their voice their memory um their action um is in my view, um, so much more than all these books <laughs> and, <laughs> and why is that not getting respected? So I kind of insisted on doing this dissertation that um, kept like put in oral tradition at parity with the written sources and my advisor hated it. <laughs> Hated it, hated it, and um, fought with me about it. And luckily, I did get so the late great Ines Talamantes, um, Apache Chicana um, religion scholar out of Santa Barbara, came to Harvard for a year, and um, she helped to push it through to like really advocating. And so, a lot of advocates, a lot of um, you know, we don't do these things alone. And so I think well, that and we don't do these things oh, alone. For some reason, we don't have enough credibility to do it alone. <laughs> right. Yeah. We have to pull in partners from over here and over there. So people will freaking believe us. Do you think it's still? I know. Um, and it's still like that, isn't it? Um, but it, you know, it really, yeah, it, it, it really is. Um, the other person I want to really shout out to is Charlotte Heff, Dr. Charlotte Heff, of Oklahoma. She was one of my mentors as well, um, who, who pulled me into NMAI. Um, and she asked me to come. So as a Cherokee ethnomusicologist, Charlotte, who was at UCLA for years, you know, another one of those, you know, like break barrier generate, you know, generation before ours, right? Like mm -hmm. really bringing it uh, through. And uh, so, right, it's like, why why are we not believed in part of um, what, what I faced and they let in a they actually let in, I don't, they probably like were so sorry after they did this at Harvard. They let in nine of us um, into doctoral <laughs> folks who were native at the same time. So there were three of us in sociology, me and Jill Gonzalez, who's Hopi, who I still work with very closely, Bernie Perleys, Maliseed, Valerie Lambert Long. Um, we all came in together in, uh, oh, Scott Stevens, uh, like a whole bunch of us. And um, I think Manly Begay was there. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, I know, Ferlin Clark. I mean, like a whole bunch of us were there and we all got let in at the same time and caused a ruckus. And so, oh, you know, you know and so, but it was good because it was, but you know, at the, after we left, um, they cycled us through. I don't, th they barely let any native students in after that, uh, native, native PhD students in after that for a long, long time. And so, you know, it's like you take these steps forward and, and they come back and, and not until, you know, we're in those places um, where you can pull people, you know, where you can pull people in. But a lot of it was about questioning, um, 
oh, you're too subjective. Like, how can you verify that this oral story is correct? Or, you know, I was like, well, well, how can you, how can you verify that when Emil Durkheim wrote what down what he said that he said that was right? Like, who, who, who fact checked on him? Right. You and, know, and what about his West, his perspective? Like, how was he really? viewing the information? It, it was tainted with something, with his beliefs. Yeah. How is it better? How is his Christian or whatever beliefs any better than than an indigenous person who has actually understands from the ground literally up um, what the the knowledge is? It's really true. And then the other question being that, um, you know, um, there's there's all those questions and and the idea that um, well, what happens if you, you know, what happens if we do make a mistake? You know, that's part of our learning situation. So like, how do you not get pilloried? Like if if something has to get, you know, revised, you learn something new, something new comes up, you rework your material. I think we're always under this incredible um, microscope, you know? And so, yeah, for me, it was like going into the academic uh, was, just another, you know, it's just another facet mm -hmm. of being able to, um, with, you know, whatever it is that we have, um, with the, with the, you know, whether it's like the personal mind resource, um, what, like, what can you, what can you contribute? What can you do? Mm -hmm. Um, and I was always, I always kept, um, an academic, uh, track along with like, the like activist grassroots track, I always did them at the same time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's been times in my career, maybe long times where I've had to kind of separate it. Like where um, I think that was very true. When I, you know, I was at NMAI for 18 years and that was um, bringing, trying to undergird like the work that I did always with that um, social consciousness. Um, but, you know, what you can say in that context. So I would kind of, you know, like do, you know, keep them more, sometimes keep things a little more separate, like, because um, you don't want to affect one or the other. And then there was kind of this long time about like, oh, okay, we've achieved a lot. So now we can go on the long trajectory. And then, you know, you have, um, I don't know more and BLM and all these other things start to hit. And, and I think it started to over, you know, it's started to move into a, another phase, but you know, when, when is it that we can um, bring that together? And I think because so many of these pieces were so hard when, I mean, NMAI happened because of movement, right. You know, so what, what Suzanne Harjo uh, was able to do and, um, you know, Vine Deloria and people who've been um, in in process for so long, the NAGPRA work, right? Like what um, what has uh, preceded it? I think all of that is part of being able to also then be in these other kinds of spaces and not have to live completely um, dual lives. Do you have to be completely assimilationist in order to live in an intellectual, you know, to act in an intellectual community, right? right? Like. Right. Um, I don't think we should, we should have to. Right. Um, you know, yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. Cause I know um, there were times during my um, academic career, whatever it was um, where you were questioned about, you know, um, who you are, why are you there? Why are you there? And then um, as a lawyer um, to pass the bar, when you pass the bar, you're supposed to, um, uh, sign uh, an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States. And so the Ho Haudenosaunee, especially the Onondaga, you know, there were um, elders there that were like, so you, you know, what are you doing here um, when you've pledged an oath to them? Uh, and so those were some interesting conversations and I'm grateful that I got to spend time with them so that we I learned really about sovereignty from, from the Haudenosaunee and the Confederacy. Uh, and what, uh, and after that, anytime I had to do an oath, I always, <laughs> my fingers crossed. Just like, you're back. 
<laughs> so that's how that's how I've like I'm not this is you know I'm having to do this so that I can do what I need to do for um, for the people mm -hmm. um, and and I know that's what you've been doing I mean um, what was it like I, I'm not sure which way to go like I want to talk about Amnesty International but I know you've worked with Indigenous women. Um, uh, wisdom keepers, and I know you've you've worked on repatriation issues, while still you know coming from this academic background. You work for the National Museum of the American Indian as a historian, so you know all about. Uh, and I don't know how many people really understand the history of the National Museum of the American Indian, and um, uh, you know that that came from railroad cars full of of theft of native peoples. And that's how that institution got started and and where are we today? But so there's a lot of stuff in there I wanna talk to you about um, and I'm not sure where to go next. So, so let me pause and take a breath. Um, uh, how, how are you feeling, Gabby? Do you, <laughs> is there something popping into your heart that you wanna talk about? Yeah. So no, I know it's, 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 there's, there's, there's so much. And I think, you know, um, I think for, for many of us who, who work on Indigenous issues, you have to, you, you do have to be versatile. And you know, we do have to uh, work on so many different kinds of things. Hi, <laughs> Kurt Seneca, who I had a wonderful opportunity to um, work with. Um, on this uh, a show that's coming it's going to be opening in nmai new york in the fall it's called native new york and which is of course lenape land so shout out to lenape yeah. like all Ooh. over like all from all the places um that you are and um seeing you know oklahoma uh wisconsin ontario i did the whole like lenape road show amazing and um you talk about survival and 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 perseverance, like so much respect to to all of um, all of your people, uh, and and I think that this is you know that's the kind of work of of being able to, um, you know, uplift, you know to be able to kind of like open the channels for um, their for their perspectives, and you know it really comes out of I think uh, from when we talk about like, okay, so wh where did this come from? Um, our burial grounds were um, completely ransacked in the, for, well, from the 19th century to the 1930s and even 40s, um, including by uh, Smithsonian. So when I got to um, Smithsonian to start, um, all it, it was Tidal Stort, who is one of the original Bureau of American Ethnology people. He was already in his 90s. He heard that I had a pre-doctoral fellowship. I don't know. He he like he came down to talk to me. And it was this weird wow. thing because, you know, he was duly responsible for part of the desecration, but it was also like somebody who was, you know, even interested in Indians like at all, like at the time that my grandfather had to even talk to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think it was like, that's where the repatriation um, drive started. And maybe like a lot of it maybe came from that because I remember going down to our burial grounds as a little girl and it was really terrifying because there was something called the blockhouse and where they had left skeletons exposed and built a cinder block house around them. And you could peer through these metal bars and look at them. Oh, wow. Well. Yeah. And yeah. So, well, it was because of a uh, movement. Um, it was, it was torn down and reburied in a moratorium on the, on the, uh, on the digging mm -hmm. um, in the mid seventies. So, so that's what, that's what um, our people did. And then with other activists who were here in the DC area, um, including, you know, with the support from national Congress, of the American Indians, mm -hmm. um, they did that. And so the desecration issues um, and then, you know, moving. Uh, so, you know, it's like kind of coming to that and thinking like, I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Like we don't want this to happen to anybody else. And then being in, I think in a place like DC, all these people come. So you hear and you listen and you walk beside them, help them out, host them. 
um, go to meetings, set up things from Congress to the Organization of American States, um, people coming in with all kinds of NGOs, World Bank, the whole thing, you know, and, and it used to be like most people didn't come on an expense account, you know, and so they would stay at like family people, you know, family and community members, couches, floors, like, I mean, decades. And so I think listening, you know, hearing that um, and then having the chance to um, travel sometimes to to those spaces and even be being in places, um, you know, I, I think I mentioned some one of the things that affected me the most in my life, you know, was kind of linking that memory of what happened at that at our burial grounds. Um, and I, you know, I went to El Salvador during the war. I was very young. I was like 19 or 20 um, and also traveled with the Amazonian confederations um, and the Andean confederations. So I was very influenced by um, Konaye and Confanyaye and Anis and um, um, people from uh, the Colombian Amazon and uh, worked with them for years, still do. Yeah. And so, but it was that idea about like, okay, so then what happens when we see it in real time? So going to massacre sites in real time. And once you see that and also see like that the Americas is indigenous, right? Like when we come from um, places maybe where we're in such a minority and then you go somewhere where, um, you know, 80% of the people are, are indigenous and then you're like, what's the big lie here? Um, and, and how does that, you know, once you kind of go through that, it's very difficult to come back from that and not, you know, recommit. I think it's, um, it's kind of seeing that simultaneously when I was trying to figure out things um, locally about what had happened at Piscataway, but at the same time, always having people um, come in people like Roberta Blackcoat and Sarah James and the Fool's Crow family and my yellow hair and like all those, you know, they're all coming in and the Dan sisters and, um, you know, going to set up meetings um, with them, for them, um, host them, figure things out. I mean, it was really, you know, many, many, many years of that. And so um, that that's like real, that's real life. And, uh, I think that, you know, when you know that and then you're just being asked, like going back to the academics, like you go back and then you're you're just asked to like say like, well, just look at what the literature is. I'm like, yeah, but I just, you know, I just been talking to people from Kunayala and it's not like that. <laughs> like so so yeah, I don't know. Um I would just I think it's just also encouraging to see um a younger generation like um being able to I don't know if you feel like this with your kids, but like I feel like um, there's like a confidence, um, yeah. Like yeah. in some ways, uh, that they they have much more of a time. Like, do they do they know the time when they didn't know who they were? You know, and that we've been able to raise them like knowing who they were, and that that was that was a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that is much different because, uh, wow, that that's kind of blowing my mind a little bit thinking about that. Um, uh, isn't that incredible that that we're able to do that today? Um, not all of us, but but a lot more of us. I mean, no wonder our voices are so much stronger now, is because we have that youth voice. There's there was a question back here. Let me see if I can find it and and bring it up. Um, here we go. As a longtime activist, um, do you want to comment on the state of Indian activism today? Because I, I don't think you can answer that without talking about um, our kids. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, hey, John. So <laughs> let, me, let me tell you about John Steinbach. Uh -oh. John Steinbach. John Steinbach is one of the most dedicated on the ground allies um, that probably, um, I don't know how much of Indian country actually knows about him, but if anybody was ever here for um, a meeting, a march, a vigil, um, didn't know where to go, needed help, got here in the middle of the night, their car broke down, whatever, you know John. 
and John, um, yeah, like, like, you know, there's, that's what I'm like, there's like a whole cadre of, you know, activists in their seventies and eighties and older. Um, he was married to uh, um, a great um, anti-nuclear activist. Um, they, they commemorate Hiroshima Nagasaki day every year. Um, and, and that's how they link to the uranium poisoning that was happening out at Big Mountain. So that, so that's, that's John, like wow. long term, like unsung heroes, right? Of people, allies that are here on the ground in grassroots DC. So, you know, talking about, you know, with thanks to you, John, um, you know, just to, you know, I just want to like sing your, sing your praise, like publicly, um, and so, you know, what we have are, I think, you know, it's really interesting. And I don't know if you felt this, Shannon, but like, you know, so like I'm in my early 50s, I'm 53, which meant that like we were kind of at this very tail end of like what was going on with AIM. Like, I mean, there was always movement stuff, but there was the, the main like real um, on the ground, uh, activist leaders were, you know, they're older. And so for those of us who got involved, we got involved, um, you know, younger, you know, teenagers, um, and then also maybe um, went, you know, for, for some of us went more into kind of like institutional um, ways of both doing the activism on the ground, but, you know, through law school, through academics, through the museum, and then yes, doing things um, along the way. But I think what I saw um, in 2014 um, was this resurgence, starting this resurgence, I think with Idle No More and BLM um, and the um, like DACA activists, you know, started to see this like surge of young uh, people, you know, starting to see it with young people. And then um, we had, uh, you know, leading into Standing Rock. And again, these are, you know, there's always been, always, always been people who've, you know, done the blockades, have, you know, really kept right. that fire burning like all these well, years. And, and that includes you, that includes you. Yeah, so, you know, there's people, you know, like, right, yeah, like, you know, that we, you know, do this, but it was it was sort of like low burn in a lot of ways, with a few mm -hmm. flares along the way, I would say probably since like, maybe since like Oka, you know? A few, and, yeah, a few tire like, fires and... Yeah, and, like, you know, yeah. But, but what you see this mass movement, I think is like, this next generation and then um, Standing Rock and then you have the runners that mm -hmm. come. And so, you know, lots of love to Jacelyn Charger who just had to go through a trial and, and you know, is now on six months probation. I mean, she should never even have to be, on, I mean, that you know, it, it, like the fact that she even had to serve any, you know, even go to court. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, you see these very young people um, making this move and then um, redrawing out, um, older activists again to stand with them but when you know you look at what's going on you know what what happened at standing rock for example and then what was going we see you know young young people you know 15 year olds um a lot of girls um and they have uh this commitment and it just it just surges up like when you see you know black lives matter youth um they're young and so i just i never thought that well first of all that we would have to that you know they would have to do that yeah it, which is you know that they have to and then um the the in, enormous Right. Um, you know, people talk about, you know, the greatest generation, um, you know, the 30s. And yes, they were. I think this is another great generation. And they they're doing it with, um, you know, they're sophisticated, they're smart. Um, when this group came in that we're, we're delivering the um, petitions in April uh, that did the Black Snake um, protest through DC and we had a dinner for them and you know it was really cool because like they came in on the bus um, and then they also had you know they had like they all had to study you know they all do their homework and um, 
And so, you know, talking about them like uh, being at school. And so I think they're, you know, they're also doing it, I think sometimes with maybe a lot more um, kind of joy than we, <laughs> you know, like they, they can be, you know, 1491, it's like they're funny as heck. And, um, uh, you know, like, wearing Beverly Yellowtail's amazing clothes. They, 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 like, they like look, you know, they look gorgeous. They're a little bit bougie, I would they have are, to say. There's they're, something they're, bougie they're just, about like, you. Yeah, as a bougie native. So like, yes, yes. Favorite time. I'm like, that's my theme song. Like, that's me. I'm like, would you like, would you like some fig balsamic with that? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, so yeah, and it's like that they can be like, so much more fully expressed um and and at the same time um you know the pressure on them um the exhaustion the 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 burnout the anxiety the you know the the traumatic um press on them it's it's a lot to bear uh you know in with such um levels of 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 danger and threat being so young um but I, I just feel like that's when, you know, you look at it and you say, you know, um, that like, there's like, um, I just gotta get a little esoteric. Okay. But like, I feel like there is like, you know, like the Haudenosaunee have this, this expression of arenda, you know, like there's, there's this, there's this constant like wave of energy and a constant um, move of 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 like spirit power, mm -hmm. and it's there. And who is going to pick that mantle up? We don't know. You know, it's going to be somebody. And that's what I think, like, when you kind of get into, like, your 50s and you kind of, you've seen people grow up and then you've seen people grow up again. <laughs> and then people starting to grow up again. <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, ah, oh, there's a pattern here. And so, so, you know, but I just, I felt like, yeah, there's, there's that, there's that, um, there is that, like, that fire like it's just you know like Choctaw right like you you know you, you carry like you carry embers like and so who's gonna get it who's gonna catch it what that faces is it a is it a you know a child who's who's in foster care is it um you know it could be so many people you don't expect and like how how is it it's oh and it's like oh my gosh it's a 14 year old did that you know the 18 year old did that you know or like working with uh you know elders oh wow you know she's like you know 88 and like she's just you know she's got it and she's tired we need to replenish her and and pick her up you know it's not just about supporting our youth we have to support our our elders you know and older people because they take care of everybody and so you know how do we take that but i just you know yeah we're getting we're not there yet there yet, not there yet, but, you know, but you know it's it's just like what's that ethic so that's what i think that's what i was like i was like there's like there's there is like there is an ancestor energy and it's flowing and no matter what has happened here um that hasn't been erased yeah it's yeah. so powerful it's just it is and, and and we were having this conversation i think uh pre-show some days ago and i was talking about you know I, I sometimes i feel so uncomfortable because i i don't know the language of this place you know i have tobacco i put tobacco down i i i don't know what to say um i i don't know how to speak to what's around me um there's no one to tell me um what to do um, so all I can do is just, you know, pray for the ancestors' voices to be heard in all of this because I look around here in Maryland and and, and out back where there's woods. I, I live in a in a wonderful place, kind of in rural Maryland, 
and there's woods, but there's hardly any diversity. I mean, it's all been chopped down at some time. It's all these poplar trees and all of these invasive species, these invasive raspberry and mustard garlic and all of these invasive species popping out and people are planting them and 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 are the native species are like only in these little areas and and taking over. And so all I can do is pray for, you know, I know your voice is here, you know, I, I, I want to hear you. I want to address you. And I also want to know um, those voices of those that are coming after us. Help push us towards those, those younger voices that are coming after us. So we're going in the right direction because this is not it, right? So we talked about being a bridge. You know, how do we get um, past that? to um, the next generation so that we can um, move in the right direction. And I think there's no better place than Maryland in this DC area to really talk about that and talk about that energy that, that, that you're mentioning. More, more young people come here. Yeah, no, and it's, you we know, need you. It, we do. And I think, and the fact that you've been able to, you know, pick up on that. And I think, you know, that's, that's an indigenous approach. It's it's about trying to see, you know, what's there to have a deeper understanding um, to, you know, we, we, we talked about that idea also about how um, when you have other people come, you know, you're bringing your ancestors uh, with you, it blends, it becomes stronger. Um, I never saw, you know, you're talking about like younger activists too, um, in these past, you know, the four, the four, uh, you know, years of, of, uh, you know, quite honestly, like just fascist and dangerous. Um, but at the same time, I had never seen so much um, active energy coming in DC in, in my life ever, um, and and so it it really is that idea about tapping on and and being conscious. And I, I think like that's, for example, you know, Curtis who, who kind of just said, hey, you know, a little earlier, you know, the fact that um, there's people um, like him going back into New York City, um, which is their homeland. We have um, people from Stockbridge, like Bonnie Hartley going back up to, you know, Troy, New York, like to have her child like born along the, the Hudson, right? Like yeah. after 200 years and, um, and then also, I don't know, I mean, maybe this is just because like, <laughs> what else are we going to do? I, I feel like, don't be so scared to try things out. Like if, if you don't, you know, for people like you don't have the language or you're trying to sort it out, you're trying to figure things out. What is it that's helpful for us now? You know, there are places that, you know, there's a lot more intact. Um, but one thing I, I learned from, I, I had this chance to um, travel and support um, elder indigenous women leaders through a group called um, Spirit Aligned and, um, you know, work with people like Henrietta Mann, like really, really closely and Sarah James and Jan Long, well, through a whole bunch of like just amazing, amazing women who also needed a lot of, you know, it's like we forget, like let's help them too. And, and what I saw was their innovation um, the way that they were, that they were, you know, like what, who are elders for our times? Um, how do we, um, sometimes just, just try things out, you know, how do you, how do you make that approach? See if you can, to, like, there's been times like I've tried to figure out, okay, so what's a place name? So having like conversations with people like Stephen August, Augustine, um, who is a, um, Mi'kmaq, um, speaker uh to try to help me wrap my head around some of the algonquin words right like mm -hmm. and not to say like what's the direct answer to me i was like when you hear this word what do you what does it sound like to you and um just just to be open and sometimes things um appear and um other people start to to understand it so mm -hmm. it's um no these are you know these are these are really truly incredible um poignant times and i think um 
there's there's a whole lot of history being made uh, that generations coming after us are going to have to listen to and i'm just so glad so much more of it's recorded um like as you know even for us to talk as i say like you never know like what what was going to be the thing that showed up in the archive or something oh, and, <laughs> um, yeah, no, seriously and so so just just to understand that like we have we have that we have that capacity and not not to be i think the older lesson for me too is like don't be afraid or feel guilty about like if you need to you know replenish your spirit too you know like that you can take some time to do that and and go to the water and and spend that time and try to figure things out and not just um you know have everything just like sucked out of you because it's um an, an uncle of mine always talks about you know this this is really a long haul you know this is this is this is intergenerational. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we work with that and and um, support each other? You know, yeah. Yes. I know it's super basic. It almost sounds cliched, but it's really true. No, it totally is. And and you can see. I remember talking to. I think I had this conversation with with Rick West once, and he kind of looked a little shocked at me. But uh, I I you know I I thanked him for all the work that he's done in with museums and repatriation issues. And I said, and I'm here to stand on your shoulders. And he kind of looked shocked. Um, uh, uh, and I meant it in a good way. I meant it, you know, I want to keep going. I want to push further, you know, because that's all we can do. We can only push so far. And then it's, it's, it's someone else younger than us turn to come and and push the next way, and and that that is a traditional way. That's not that's not offensive. That's um, you know not there's no ownership here. This is we're all doing this together to make our lives better, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the uh, an indigenous perspective uh, that we've always had, right? Um, I, I want to uh, remind everyone that if you have um, college age kids or you yourself want to take a class, uh, Gabby is going to be teaching at George Mason University in the fall. Uh, so please look her up there and look at the classes that she's teaching. Do you want to mention that that class, the ancestors to? Yeah, so Thanks for bringing that up. So, like, yeah. So now for my my next trick. Um, <laughs> I really had this feeling of um, wanting to right, like, kind of take stock, figure out, you know, what I've learned. How do we transmit it in a in a much more um, direct way? Like, so I've taken on a um, position as an associate director, uh, associate professor of public history. Um, public history means like anything you see in public, like a museum, a historic site, um, you know, anything that's that's not just like written in a historic um, kind of academic book um, or article, which are all great too. Um, so I'm doing, I'm doing, uh, I'll be teaching two courses, but one um, would be open, like if you are in the Fairfax area, I believe that anybody who maybe is over the age of 60, you know, Michael Nephew, I think is going to audit my class, yay. Oh, uh, so <laughs> and, and so I'm teach. I'm going to be teaching a, a class, a history class that's called Ancestors it's Native America ancestors to 1812, um, I think is where I'm going to kind of kept it. And so we'll be looking at like about a third of the class. Uh, we'll be looking at the, the vast, um, the vast experience and just, you know, presence, just trying to highlight um, what, what, um, what was on our continent, like as, you know, cities rose and fell and people managed their forests and created, um, some of the, the, the greatest democratic systems the world has ever known. Mm -hmm. Um, and then looking at, you know, the, the catastrophic, um, 
invasion, but also like how how people um, worked um, in the context of um, of European empire and and managed uh, to hold on during what's called the colonial period, and then looking at then early of what what set up. Um, going forward. So we'll be highlighting that. So I think it's going to be an interesting class. My colleague, Joseph, uh, Jonathan Palawa in the spring will be taking on the, the next half. So we're kind of team 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 teaching on, on the, the scope and trying things out. But um, yeah, like we'll, we'll be looking at um, not just writing papers, but also how to create and think about um, the relevance in, in, um, in our in our lives and um, really highlighting those native voices so i'm really looking forward to that and uh, working more with um, instituting uh, more indigenous studies there's actually not a lot um in the chesapeake region very no there's no yeah i think i calculated my percentage of you know <laughs> like scholars <laughs> i was like how many Piscataway PhD like scholars are there? You know, I think like out of what like 3,600 of us, maybe there's like two of us. Um, so I was like, I think we're like 0.004% or something of the population. So we're not like we're not taking over the world anytime soon. But you know, I think um, yeah. So I so I would love for people to um, to interact. Also, Native New York is opening in NMAI uh, New York in um, September. So right. we'll celebrate the communities and the community scholars that um, that work with that. I co-curated that with David Penny. Um, so that's, that's opening. Um, soon so yeah, and I'm always I'm always learning, you know, it's like great, the more we learn, the less we know. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. I know. I thought, I thought at some point I'd quit being dumber every year. And I feel like I'm, it's, it's like, wait a minute, is this, isn't this downhill spiral supposed to like go in the other direction now? It's like, no, yeah, <laughs> Look how even less that you know. Yeah, all less that we know. I think I have to say though, like it's kind of cool, like at this stage of where you kind of like, oh wow, I think I kind of know how to do that. Maybe I could teach somebody how to do that too. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like something clicks every once in a while. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, I think I do have some wisdom here and in, in this in this little area, but don't let it you know go to your head or anything. Yeah. Um. But but I think part of part of um growing up and growing up again and growing up again um, is that we come to recognize um, uh, this thing that we have within ourselves um, that has been there throughout time, not just our life, but throughout time that keeps us connected and grounded. And I think as we get older, we, we come to a, a, a deeper level of understanding and, and, and drive, or hopefully we're letting that talk more for us than than our pride and our ego and in our lack of maturity that we had in, in in younger years and 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 Gabby I'm so glad to 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 know you and um, to be a part of your activism and um, since I've been in DC I've noticed uh, and then we've got to wrap up I know we need to wrap up I'm sorry um, I could keep you talking here forever definitely um, but since I've been in DC, I've, I've noticed that I've, I've become more disconnected uh, to community and community here. And that's something I'd like to resolve. And so I'm looking forward to um, the pandemic kind of uh, uh, letting go of us a little bit. And I hope that we can see each other soon. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's, uh, you know, and just to, to get a sense of, um, you know, we're, we're going just to be, I think, also compassionate with ourselves, you know, like, this is what we've all gone through in all different levels and, and experiences, um, that this is a time of, um, of reintegrating, of recovery, of, of understanding. And I, I admire you so much. I mean, the work <laughs> you've done, the snag public policy, um, you know, that's, it's, it's right when people like on the daily and also representing um, the association, keeping that uh, going for, I mean, what a, 
what an incredible um, body of work. So some someday I'm gonna yeah, sometime soon I would need to interview you. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I think you know, but yeah, I think just to just to um, express it, um, I saw like a practice that was done uh, when I had a chance to work with. Um, uh, Yvonne uh, Dupuy uh, Peterson, who's a Chehalis um, basket weaver, traditional weaver, um, but also political scientist trained by Vine Deloria. And so she invited me to come out to, um, she was one of our legacy leaders in the program. And um, they, ha they have a teaching canoe um, that they did on the paddle. And we got there maybe like, it must have been almost a month after uh, they had all come back from, you know, one of the, the big, you know, the big paddles that they do in the Northwest. And so something that they, they do after the journey um, is about two weeks to about a month after um, they have something that's called calling their spirit back. Oh. And so it's like, you know, because you've touched and you've been through all kinds of um, experiences. And so when you come back home, um, to not right, right, right away, but soon to have like a time to come, you know, the family comes together, the community comes together. They did, you know, just kind of like reabsorbing, you know, those of us who take like yoga, my favorite position is the corpse pose. You just lay there. <laughs> the <shavasana. laughs> so I think it was, like, it was so, I was like, this is so brilliant. Like mm. this is so brilliant to understand that, that when you close, it's not just like, okay, this is over. But to know, like, all right, there's going to be another little part, you know, maybe a month or a couple months later, that you're still affected by um, mm -hmm. journey that you took, and that that you need to acknowledge that when things start to settle, you know, and just take that wow. time. And I've thought about that a lot. I was like, that that's a that's a brilliant practice um, to call the spirit back after after you've been out there. So um, that's kind of I just feel like that's maybe where we were that's what we're heading into soon um and taking some time so yeah we'll be in touch we'll get you down on the water and we'll <laughs> like take a walk and talk and everybody should do that wherever they are as well when they can yes beautiful well thank you so much for for joining us gabby and and uh, uh i hope we see you again sometime soon and maybe um stick this in your in your um in your brain uh maybe we can think about uh, a panel or a group discussion that you might want to have uh about the local community here or um or or something of interest uh to you in history or otherwise so i hope we can we can bring you back soon yeah that's great all right thanks so much for having right. me it was fun to talk to you <laughs> no, no, okay. all right bye everybody y'all know where bye. i live you're bye. fine okay <laughs> all right all right we'll see you later and i'll i'll close out here and and uh <sighs> Another another show has has passed us by everyone. I hope I hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure to share it with your friends and family and, and let folks know that we're here. The purpose of Red Hoop Talk is so that you can get to know um, uh, indigenous peoples uh, in the U.S. and, and perhaps other places. Uh, that and how folks stay close to culture. This is this is for us. This is for um, our native nations and our indigenous people so that we can see ourselves and um, and share how we stay close to culture and how we stay in community uh, and our wonderful paths and stories that we have to share with one another. And then maybe in the process of all of this, um, since this is a public forum, that other people will also see us for who we are and our many different faces and the way that we look and the things that interest us and, and what we talk about uh, so that there's a better uh, understanding of who indigenous peoples in the United States are. So um, I really appreciate that you all have joined us tonight. Again, my damn bra keeps falling out of here, you guys. So um, nobody's perfect. Oh, well, let it go. Um, that's what my auntie would say, right? She's like, ah, who cares? I guess it needed to pop out there, whatever. Um, <laughs> Judith, it's good to have you here too. And welcome Ada. Um, I want to remind everyone to please 
like, subscribe, and comment in YouTube. The, one of the purposes that we started Red Hoop Talk was to help um, hopefully create um, video content that was useful to folks and also to help monetize um, the videos so that we can help bring another source of funding into the Association on American Indian Affairs. So um, we'd love to have your help. Please like, comment, and subscribe on our YouTube channel. And uh, just to let you know, our repatriation conference is coming up in November. Uh, we could love your support and would love your help with our repatriation conference. Uh, if you'd like to sponsor or provide a donation for our repatriation conference, that funding will go directly for scholarships for uh, tribal officials uh, who are unable to uh, budget attendance in their in their budget and also small museums who don't have the budget to attend um, to attend for free at our uh, repatriation conference, which is a, a really in-depth training, technical experience and uh, technical training and um, networking experiences. Uh, we're going to have federal agencies, uh, academics, lawyers, all sorts of people talking about issues of repatriation. And of course, it's open to the public. So you can find out more information about our repatriation conference on indian-affairs.org. That's the website for uh, the Association on American Indian Affairs. Again, thank you all. It's so wonderful to see you. My name is Shannon. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, Yokoki. See you next week. Oops, hold on. Ha, 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 ha.